What we're going to talk about for the next 60 to 90 ish minutes or so is pockets of liquidity. This is a really, really cool discussion that I've had before. And essentially it's about finding large institutional accumulation and distribution areas. Number one, number two, it's also about practicing how to buy lower and sell higher. As easy as it sounds, it's an amazing, amazing investing strategy. Buy low, sell high, or on the flip side of that, sell high and buy low. Oftentimes you can use multiple time frame analysis to kind of give you some ideas and some insight on how that would play out and what that looks like. This is a really, really great example. If I pop over to Microsoft today of not only pockets of liquidity, but essentially also the distribution and accumulation zones that really happen at bigger levels. Here is the weekly chart on Microsoft. Now, first and foremost, these bigger levels oftentimes are comprised of weekly and monthly locations because long-term money doesn't really care. Often times about like days, hours, or weeks, they really are a lot more patient than me and you very frequently. I was watching an interview yesterday with Steve Barron and he mentioned that he really likes to double his money every four to five years. I think that's a fascinating idea, but also when you're talking about large size, it really helps you kind of understand that's how the scale starts tipping. You start practicing larger and larger and larger size, putting yourself in the mindset and also the skill set, the awareness and the practice of how certain traders, certain investors, certain places are doing certain investments and certain trades at certain prices. Now, looking at Microsoft, just simply as it put, notice initially how the 100 on the weekly chart was used as a support level for a period of time. And then notice how right at this exact moment, it's used as a resistance level. And then also keep in mind how the 200 is used as a support level. And what we're talking about here really is looking for and identifying levels that you can just set your entries to buy and or set your entries to sell and just kind of wait it out and see what comes into your price. So that, that way you have a much, much better risk reward ratio. And again, you can hold for a little bit longer. We are going to back trade this and I'll explain realistically what pockets of liquidity are. When you're trading in the markets, the order flow has to be filled. You have buy orders and you have sell orders. Even when you go and back trade and you're paper trading, you're not even on the real market. You're not even in the real time. How many trades will you get into that you get wicked out or stopped out of that position, even though that trade wasn't real? And many traders have discussed and talked about that market makers are hunting your stops. And it's not that market makers are hunting your stops. What market makers are looking for are sell orders. Because if you purchase a stock long, how someone had to sell it to you. So if a market maker or if an exchange has a large buy order that comes into, well, comes into the exchange, how does that order get fulfilled? You have to match buyers with sellers. So they're going to go look for selling opportunities. They're going to look for places where there's a bunch of sellers to fulfill so they can fulfill that arrangement. They can fill that requirement. So here on Microsoft, just as a really, really quick example, what an interesting spot down here at this support. I love this trap that happened down here. And again, I'm not saying that you always have to be this person or spot this person, but oftentimes once you know that it occurs, then it becomes even more fun because you can see that it happened. And if you can look at this and assume, even if you were, or we're not in this trade, this right here is a pocket of liquidity. This is where you have a bunch of sell orders that were fulfilled for some buyers. And the market makers, the overall markets, saw a ginormous level of sell orders down there, and they went and fulfilled those orders so that 
those customers could buy at those particular prices. I do love being the person in the big yellow arrow. It's one of my favorite things. And the way to find it is to look at and just ask yourself on the chart, where will every newer trader have their stop losses? It's a good question to ask. Where will a bunch of new traders have all of their stops? Either bullish or bearish. And if you can start answering that question, you can generally come up with areas where you start to kind of pre-frame in the future where you should be a buyer and or where you should be a seller. It helps you as you practice it to kind of identify both price areas and support resistance or supply and demand areas so that you kind of know, all right, up at this price, I should be more net selling. Up in this particular price, I should be more net buying. And once you know, you can take advantage of that. Maloney says, Jan, why are they new traders? Even experienced traders would have it there, correct? This is true. So it doesn't have to be brand, brand new traders. It can be anyone. But new traders will definitely place it there for sure. But it can be an experienced traders. It can be anyone for sure. Justin says, I remember an exact quote from Jeremy where one of the free courses, find where other people have their stops and get in there. Yeah, precisely. This was a really, really cool example on Microsoft because I did get asked, and this is not an exaggeration, by five individual traders, Jeremy, should I get into Microsoft on a swing trade today? So when we're talking about the psychology of traders, keep this in mind that it's always easiest to buy at the absolute wrong time. Write it down, print it out, put it on your keyboard, practice that. When you look at a chart, I would say for most traders who have less than four years of either experience or four years of profitable experience, and this relates to me every day, I have to battle through this emotion every day. When I see a trade, I'm like, oh, wow. I feel so good about this trade. There's no fear at all. There's no worry. There's no panic. I'm like, whoo, I'm buying pretty high. <laughs> I, I am a high buyer right now. That's how I know. If I'm like, yep, man, I'm missing it. I feel like the, I feel a quick urge to get in. I'm buying high. It's the coolest feeling in the world, but every trader is going to have to battle that. And the lower it gets, the less you feel like buying, the more afraid you become. And when you become nice and afraid, you will not buy generally, unless you have it planned ahead of time. This is because you can, as traders, when you're investing or you know taking a longer swing trade, you can sit down and very, very quickly analyze 20 or 30 stocks and just identify where you should buy on a longer time frame, where you should sell on a longer time frame, and have your orders there. Are you going to fill in all 20? No. But you might fill in three or four of those. And if you fill on three or four of those, that might be all you need if you bought low enough. Because at that stage, once you buy low enough and you can hold for a little bit of a period of time, the capabilities and the possibilities of that stock doing a nice little move for you where you can eventually get into a collar strategy, which everyone should learn, especially if you have more than $200,000 to trade at your disposal. At that stage, you can just start playing really, really good defense and lock in some beautiful, beautiful positions. So why was Microsoft a very interesting trade today? Well, two reasons. As I look at it right now, I'm not even going to worry about the wave count, although it looks to me like a one, two, three wave count. But beside that, I mean, this could be a four and this could be a little bit of a five. But other than that, pretty simply, you had a wave structure. I'm not even going to go into this retest gap, the fact that it retests into the 200 and it bounced a little bit higher from there. I'm just going to look at this as a, all right, how would this trade have played out against the resistance? So if we go into a weekly chart, again, using multiple time frame analysis, you can see the 100 simple on the weekly as this resistance. Type in a five if you can see that. Now, the best part is you would have been able to see that all week. You'd been able to see that for the last seven weeks. You would have known where that is. So it's not like this is an ultra special price. So imagine if you bought Microsoft down this general area and when it trades into the 100 simple, this is where you get into a collar strategy. 
So if you buy Microsoft down here and hold up into here, you're up 22% on a pretty large position because again, Microsoft being top three largest companies in the world, this is a company where you shouldn't really be afraid at throwing some legit money behind it. So I'm not talking $7, but I'm talking like 700,000 or 7 million isn't even a drop in the bucket. I mean, $700 million on Microsoft is like me and you going out and buying a cheeseburger. Sometimes it's good to think in these large numbers to really, really just sit down and get your mind stretched. Because if you want something you've never had before, you have to do something you've never done. And oftentimes for individuals, that's sitting down and just going through the state of abundance, especially as it relates to the market, because the market doesn't care about your money. It's too large to even notice. So now if we pop into, let's just hypothetically say a three minute chart. So on a three minute chart, notice how uh, this actually pulls into a particular level. Now, one of the best pockets of liquidities that I'm aware of for day traders is pre-market. For anyone who's actively trading, pre-market is a fantastic way to just identify and determine where buyers and sellers have their stop losses. Because a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times people who are trading pre-market are often in other countries where they're asleep and they can't really do anything. So their order's already there, their price point's already there, their order's already fulfilled, so they're just kind of hanging out. So if I'm sitting here notating Microsoft for just a moment, let's just go look at a five minute chart for a bit and just kind of analyze something unique here. I'm gonna draw two areas where I think it was very, very clean and pretty obvious where a pre-market support resistance would have been and what we would have done about it. Now, this one is relatively obvious. I don't know for sure if this candle is extremely accurate or not, but I'll draw a green line down there just in case. So before the market opened, I like to think that you could have had these three levels drawn on Microsoft. Case in point, this being a little bit of a support, aka old resistance there, which coincides with this little pivot right there. You'll be able to see this if I put a line chart on. If you need help with your pre-market support and resistances, just put a line chart on. But type in a nine if you can clearly see some very, very specific price actions at those levels. Now, again, this is for day trading. We're going to go look at more on the swing-ish level, but these pockets of liquidity are just prices where there's a bunch of people buying or selling and there's, there's a levels there and they have stop losses or entries or exits. And so just looking at the chart and trying to determine where people have their stop losses, the biggest piece is sitting down and planning what you are going to do hours from now or minutes from now. I'm not saying that you're always going to do it. What I am saying is it's that practice. It's the implementation of you going, I'm going to do this based on this information. The more quickly you can get into that process and procedure, the better for all aspects of your life. A lot of individuals ask me why and how I have my time management nailed down so beautifully. And it really is because I'm just planning everything so far out in advance. I'm sitting down for an hour on a Saturday night with as little distractions as possible and just kind of planning the next six, seven, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 months out for certain aspects or situations or things that I want to do. So we want to plan ahead. Now, why is this crucial? Well, notice these pockets of liquidity. You will know that, and you would have known that in advance, this 100 simple is going to be on the weekly chart, a really nice resistance. Once this breakout happens really early in the morning, there's absolutely nothing. I mean, from a price perspective, there's no candle, no flitch, no glitch, no dash, no nothing between there and the 100 simple on the weekly. So that's a nice, easy $2 a share, first and foremost or any of my scalpers or active traders. Then number three or four or five, 
is if you knew this in advance and you know that, all right, well, there's going to be a lot of people taking this breakout of this pre-market, but I know that the 100 simple in a weekly is right up here. I'm going to short off of this level where they stop three or $4 away. That would have worked out pretty well. Well, what if you go new something? I don't want to short blindly. I'm not smart enough to do that yet. I don't want to just short off of a weekly moving average. What else could I do using this pocket of liquidity stuff? Well, the line that I have drawn, the top pink line, which is that pre-market, that initial pre-market resistance. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit if I can without changing everything. And what we're going to notice for a moment is the opening bull candle. I'm going to draw a blue arrow there. And notice who can describe to me that candle. What's the information here that it shows? All right. Brian Thompson says that is a Marabozu candle. Okay. Shave bottom, shave top. Yes, you're absolutely correct. Long day candle. Yes, absolutely correct. All those statements are accurate. Look at the volume. Huge, huge, huge buying volume. So Marbozu candle out the gate, strong buying at a massive, massive weekly resistance after Microsoft, the second or third or fourth largest company in the world, depending on when you look at it, is up 22% in a month and you have massive volume. Again, these are all things you can think about before market open or at night or a little bit in the morning that you can kind of plan ahead of time. When we closed below that candle volume, Greg's calling that bullish capitulation. Yep, that's absolutely right. Tons of buyers just flooding it in, thinking that Microsoft's going to go to the moon. This right here is approximately 3.5 million shares of newer traders or overzealous traders or overeager traders or financially optimistic traders who just haven't studied support and resistance a lot yet. So when we close below that price point with another bear candle, that one white soldier Marabozu bull candle at the pre-market resistance at a pocket of liquidity becomes a really clean resistance. So if we pop in and just look at this candle to analyze it for a moment, when this close happens, you have two levels to give you extra justification of this trade, really maybe even three. You have level number one being that this is a pocket of liquidity now. Number two, you have the 100 simple moving average as a resistance. Number three, I could argue that you have this really nice shave top bear candle. And then number four, you have this really nice shaved bottom bull candle that we just closed below. So my interpretation would be limit sell here, stop loss here, and then walk away for a little bit. The more you practice that, the more you practice the, let me plan this ahead of time because right at this stage, all we're looking at is a lot of volume got closed below. We rejected the 100. I'm gonna do a limit sell off of here and a stop loss up here. If you do that trade based on some analysis and you take it and you walk away, you're beginning to practice the, oh, okay. I did my analysis ahead of time. I now no longer cares what happens. Because that's the approach of the whole pocket of liquidity piece anyway, is for you to know where you're doing something, plan it ahead of time based on just support and resistance, looking at where everyone's going to have their stop losses, and then letting the trade happen for you. Because those are the trades that will be the most profitable. So we get filled. It kind of does its thing for a little bit. It eventually rolls over. And now we're coming into the next area and next support level, the next pocket of liquidity. 
So you have this one and then you have this one. So for me, if I am aware of this and I go, all right, well, there's obviously a lot of support down here. There's a lot of stops down here. There's a lot of people going to get trapped down there. This is where I can either A, exit a partial, B, start getting into some other type of hedge where I'm selling puts, buying calls, or beginning to lower my stop loss because I'm at a really, really key level. Once we break that level, we do what's extremely, extremely common, which is we will retest it. Right, We retest, we break below the old pocket liquidity. Now that old support becomes, again, just classic simple resistance. I know I'm repeating just the basics of trading, but now we're doing it at a level that you all know where all these stop losses are at, all these people are interacting with the price point, and you're really, really able to see what's happening. Because this could really, really easily, most likely, potentially, uh, prevent you from going long on Microsoft right here. I don't know if anyone did this trade, but here's your bear candle closing above the 10. And so it would have prevented you from going long just because that's a very clear, super obvious pre-market pocket liquidity support where everyone had their stops. And so you know there's gonna be a lot of trading over there. So it doesn't mean like, oh, Jeremy, what about it? It could work. It's like, yeah, it sure could. But if that is gonna play out, you don't wanna buy at that price. You want to buy below that price. I'll say that again. If you're at a pocket of liquidity and you're like, man, this sure should hold as a resistance. You don't want to buy at that price. You want to buy lower than that price. If you know it's a pocket of liquidity, you want to get in as low as you possibly can, not as high as you can. So you're going to just essentially just throw in your limit buy and see if it goes down to a particular level rather than being super aggressive on a breakout. Takes practice, but not a ton. So now we'll go look at Tesla for just a moment on a day trade level. And then we're going to go to a little bit of a, a larger time frame on some stocks because I think it's fun. And look at just what a beautiful, beautiful example Tesla was today of, again, a pocket of liquidity and just how everything was shaping up. So I'm going to go to a 15-minute chart. And I did take this trade. And I'm going to zoom out to here. And we're going to look at this level of support and resistance. So first and foremost, what's the overall trend on Tesla? The trend right now is bullish. Got it. Number two, are there any moving averages on any major time frames above, you know, around this 202, 203, 204 area? The answer is no. Nope, there's no major moving averages. There's nothing there. Like, okay, cool. Got it. Understand. So then uh, let's just zoom out to the hourly, actually, just so we can see it a little bit more clearly. But even on the hourly chart, you'll notice how strong of a resistance this was for Tesla. Really, 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 really strong. Here's a really, really cool signal about pockets of liquidity. The very foremost candle that I see shaping up at these resistance or support levels without question, very frequently are dojis. Doji, long leg, like indecision candles. And I will just simply play these candles, whatever the way they break, if we are above or below pocket of liquidity. So in, in, for the example of Tesla today, if we had traded down into here today, in this little green circle, would you all consider that to be just based on this pre-market chart, a pocket of liquidity? The answer is yes, absolutely. All right. So what if we break that, retest it? We're not going to buy there, right? We want to buy lower than there. It trades down into here. Would this be another pocket of liquidity for Tesla? And the answer again is yes. Just really based on this hourly and based on pre-market. So what I'm going to do is pop into one of my more favorite time zones, time frames, and go into a three-minute chart. And you'll notice I'm not using any indicators. I'm not using anything special. I'm using just candlesticks and just support and resistance. And I'll uh, show you the very, very first candle that comes in. So the very first candle is a three, three-minute big bear volume candle. Next candle, boom. We close above that candle. Hammer candle. 
and has a little bit of an upper shadow. Is it useful in your opinion that this candle closes above the high of that bear candle? Yeah, I think that's pretty pretty big deal. All those bears are trapped. And again, now using the just simple fact that this is a pretty strong hammer and that upper shadow, again, does kind of relate to and show you the sellers that are in this candle. This says, hey, if we go above all this bear volume, these people can very well be trapped. So next candle, boom. Good close, strong, strong close above the pocket of liquidity. Big volume, huge breakout. Now, I know what you're saying. Newsom, shouldn't you be shorting here? And the answer is, sure, absolutely. Although there's no major moving average on any time frame in the way right now, you could certainly short Tesla here. Trends bullish, no major moving averages, but you could certainly short Tesla. The next candle that comes in is your doji indecision candle. Here's your reversal. This is what's amazing about pockets of liquidity. They're not really, we they're, they're pretty easy. They're very fast. This is the takeaway I want you all to have. They're quick. You don't really have to sit, sit out here and wait for 45 minutes. This is the candle. So if it's going to go lower than this, it needs to go lower the next one or two candles. And if it's going to go higher, it's going to go higher the next one or two candles. You can play that candle in whatever direction that you want to play it at. If you were already short and you're already triggered in, your stop is right here. So anytime I play a pocket of liquidity, anytime I'm shorting at resistances or buying at supports, I am looking for these candles and I'm just going to bloop, bracket them. and play it accordingly. So if it just breaks down, sweet. I'm already in short. My stop is above that high. Hope the trade works. Or if I'm in short and we break above here, which again, this was this is what this is what I did by the way. So there one's clear. I did take this trade and this is exactly how I played it. I was like, "All right. Not only am I short, but I'm short out of pocket of liquidity. I'm short at a really really amazing resistance, but we just closed above resistance. There's definitely some bull signals on here and this is a bear candle with the decision closing above the 10 EMA." So as Justin mentions, I'm already in. So, right, I've already shorted this pocket of liquidity. I am in here. And now that this doji has come in, I have now set up my stop loss and my awareness to go, all right, if we break higher, I'm going to get out and get in long. And if we break lower, I'm going to hold my trade. Next candle, boom. So did we break lower, boys and girls? No, I mean, we didn't even, we didn't even wick lower at all. So did I lose on my bear trade? Yes. Lost very small, like 0.23, something almost negligible. And then was able to go long here right above that bear candle. Wrote it past the grandma number of 200. And sold at the other grandma number of 202 and some change. And just this little trade right here, again, depending on size and awareness and all that stuff, just this little guy. What's cool about trading team, and I want this to sink in in a fun way. If you are really, really, really comfortable with any overall direction and your overall strategy, even if you don't have to take tons of trades, just with this trade, just this one, would it have been possible? I mean, this is, let's just say $3 a share, 190, 199 to 202. Could you have done 10,000 shares, made 30 grand, five minutes? Win says, is there a class or video on pocket liquidity? You're in it. Welcome to class. <laughs> Congratulations, you made it. So any questions on that so far? So we'll pause here for a minute because this, this was a trade. This was a really, really cool trade. Terrence says, did you record this? Of course, Terrence. Next question. By the way, Terrence, you got to put a dollar into the foundation. 
One dollar, RLF Foundation. Anytime you want to ask if I'm recording something, got to throw in a dollar. So I'm going to keep an eye out for you, Terrence. <laughs> I better see the RLF button go up another dollar, my man. Justin says stop was below the entry candle. Stop was below the entry candle. Stop was below the entry candle. Nope. So I'll I'll try it again. Let's back up. Trade looks like this. Pocket of liquidity. I'm shorting. Stop loss is up here. Target is back down here. I realize and I'm aware that this is really re looks pretty bullish to me. So I'm assuming we're going to pop up into here. And again, based on pockets of liquidity, I'm looking for everyone stops you're at. Once I get filled, I'm looking for doji candles and I bracket those doji candles and play it from there because pockets of liquidity are going to reverse very quickly. They do not wait long. Next candle, Justin, am I filled short? Yes or no? Justin says yes. So Justin, could Tesla have done this and I make two R's on the trade? Yeah, I do this trade all the time. In fact, I had a buddy of mine named Lucas who actually played this pocket of liquidity long and sold up here. That was one of the better trades I've ever seen, actually. Really, really, really good trade. Because notice, can you, type, can you see, type in a seven if you can see the pocket of liquidity there. I'll draw support for you. You guys see that one? Just based, this is again, based on pre-market. This is more day trading pockets of liquidity. Yeah, so Lucas bought it down here at 195 with a stop a little bit lower than these candles than this wick and rode that bad boy up. It was amazing. So I played the other side. I'm in short. Next candle, doji candle, and I go, beautiful. There's my doji. I don't mess around with pockets because I know exactly how they're going to work. So stop loss is going to go right here. And I also know that the overall move is bullish. We did break above resistance. We did close above resistance. This is a bear candle closing above the 10 EMA. So now I'm going to go long and I just need to play that candle right there because I know that these bad boys, when they move, they're going to move. And so this becomes my new trade right there. Woodshed says, do you ever double your stop order? So if you get stopped out, you will be triggered in long. Literally talking about that right now, brother. Yep. That's precisely and exactly what I did today on Tesla. Just that. So I know where these candles are in, when these pockets of liquidity happen. And again, I realize this is a little bit more of an advanced maneuver, but I'm setting this trade up to go, I want to short as high as possible and I'm going to find out if I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to be basing this on a doji. Quick question. Is there times where I can short into a pocket of liquidity and just kind of keeps running, hits my stop and then rolls over? Of course, this is trading, right? But I really like to know ahead of time what I'm looking for. And so when this candle comes in, I'm in long and I got stopped out of my short. So do you guys want to keep practicing? Cool. Let's keep practicing. So Tawana, uh, give me a stock and tell me what time frame. Tawana, ALB on three minute. All right. Let's go look at this bad boy. All right. So I'm just going to start with what we have, what I have here in front of me. Obviously a pretty illiquid stock for day trading has really, really, really poor volume, but all good. So this is a level that I will draw on my, my resistance line at uh, before market open. And this would have been a support level that I would draw on my. So this right here is my pocket of liquidity based on before today even opens. So this is today's chart. So before that chart even opens, this is where I'm looking for. And based on the support down here, the support down here, the resistance right here, the resistance right here, and this little pocket of resistance there, I'm doing one of two things. I'm either going long here or shorting up here. That's it. Depending on the price of the stock. So this is 280-ish dollars. So if I'm short, Let's go look at how I would have shorted today. Now I can see I'm aware of what happens here, but let me go zoom in really quick. 
And what we're going to notice is right here, this is now above pre-market high, because again, it's not a lot of data here, but the pre-market resistance, I will draw with a random line, this little dash. So that's the red line is pre-market resistance. This little bull candle. So this is a, this is the high of yesterday. So if I'm looking at this pretty easy for me, I'm going to short above pre-market high, above prior resistance. Here's a little bit of resistance right there. And I'm going to put my stop generally $3 on a $280 stock this early in the morning. I'm placing it $3 away. I did it with Tesla. I did it with many other stocks, but it's going to be about three bucks generally away from the entry. So about 1%, exactly. So I'm shorting right there. I'm filled on the short. That's a doji candle. So I'm interested to see what's going to happen. So when this candle comes in, right, obviously the break above was extremely fast. I know that I'm able to lower my stop dramatically. Really, really quick. Because this is the doji reversal, right? That's that's the pocket liquidity. You're going to get candles like that. So I'm able to lower it dramatically. I could probably even put it right there. But since this is a little, a little on the wickier side, I'm just going to manage it pretty well. But I'm going to drop it. And I will start planning. Very easy place to know that I'm wrong. If we go above here, I can go long. Right? So I think you guys are all following me on that. And then it, it really doesn't need to go that far to start making you some good gains. Right here, you're already at 1R. Two candles in. The point is, it's the practice of doing this. The reason that this is a very, very unique and very fun practice to do is because it will help you understand that in your trading, you want to be looking for levels where everyone else is doing something and you want to be doing something generally relatively opposite. Justin says, why wouldn't you have had your flip order to go long above the indecision candle? So this is your indecision candle right here, uh, right there. And all we're waiting for is you're absolutely waiting for that to occur, but you still want, since this is, Bull candle, bull candle, bull candle, bull candle. Four bull candles in a row. You still want a bear candle to come in. You want some level of selling because that just goes down to the other rule of just trading is if you're embarrassed, you don't want to move your stop on a bull candle. Because like I mentioned, Justin, you'll get stopped out in this position. I'm not saying that these, these trades, you never lose on them. Sometimes I short and it just goes bull, 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 all the way to the high and I get stopped out. I'm like, well, that sucks. That didn't work. But when I'm right, I'm able to kind of see it pretty quickly. So in this situation, you have all these bulls in a row. You get a bear candle. Once that bear candle comes in, you're able to start playing the flip if you need to. Because look, I'll go back to Microsoft example. Now that you saw this, Justin, now that we're, we've practiced on ALB, I'll go back to Microsoft and I'll show you that reversal candle that came in this morning. Check it out. And again, guys, they happen fast. So look, using pre-market, bull, 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 kind of indecisive, not really, not really, not really. There's your doji. So up until that entire time, I'm just kind of waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Once that little, again, I'm looking for these really indecisive candles on slightly larger time frames. I'm looking at the 30-second chart. Three minute, here's your five minute. Type in a nine if that's perfect. I mean, it's a pretty it's pretty cool to see how these candles really, really pan out, but they are there. They will happen. So I'm just letting you all know that when you're looking for these areas, this is how fast they should happen in the morning. They should happen relatively quickly. And if they don't, flip it. So let's go look at a stock that I really love to backtrade, um, Overstock. This is a crazy stock. And we're going to go to the daily chart. I'm going to back way up. And let's do a little bit of a unique time frame. Let's just make it a little bit on the harder side. Let's do a four-hour chart and go back to something crazy. 2016, 07, 07. So don't even, don't even know anything about this. So now we're, we're just going to pop in the four-hour chart just so we can see how some of these pocket of liquidities are going to be holding up. All right. So 
We have a really nice support resistance here. We have a really nice, really, really beautiful pocket of liquidity right there. And this is where I would love to buy. A little bit of a larger position too. So now this is a little bit of a bigger time frame that we're talking about. And we can still look for these dojis. And I'm just interested to see how long it takes before we get down there. Cause I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident that we do. This is a big one. I mean, just look at this void, you know, that is pretty interesting. And granted, you can see right now the breakout, the pullback into here, old resistance becoming new support. We're really just chopping around. So this is a really, really ugly four hour chart. And we're going to go practice the daily chart as well in just a second. But I'm just going to press play for a second just to just to analyze and see how these levels happen. Because again, once you begin to practice, you want to go in with the mindset and the belief that you know what you're looking for, that you know what you're doing, that you know how you're doing it, and you're just patient enough to allow it to occur. Because as you backtrade, one of the things that you want to take note of is you do want to take note of how long something takes for it to occur. So right now on Overstock, we did trade lower. Uh, didn't quite get to my level, but now I'm, I, I really, really am enjoying this area because now this is going to be even a better spot. Everyone and their mom has stops down there. So, so far I've waited from July to August. So we've waited almost about a month as, as some change. And again, I'm pretty sure we're eventually going to make it down to this price point. I'd be relatively shocked if we don't because it's just almost so clean to me. Now, again, what's interesting and what's cool as you backtrade, the more and more and more you backtrade, the more you'll be able to see how long cer certain things take. Dang, look how close that got. Look how close that got. Amazing. The low of this candle was, I still think it's a get there, 1431. The low of this candle, 1434. So this will be a really, really fun spot when we get down there. I do think we do. But even just being able to see that area. Um, this is, so on a little bit of a larger time frame, Philip, I'm going to be looking at something like this. I'm going to be buying a little bit here. I'm going to buy a little bit here. I'm going to buy a little bit here. The larger the time frame, the larger size you buy. <laughs> the larger size you buy, the larger amount of days that you spread your position over. I want to jot that one down. So we're just going to keep pressing play. Again, I know this isn't a random time frame, the four-hour chart. But just interested to see when we get down to this price point. It's coming. Again, so far we started in July. We're now in October. The next earning is coming up. Here we come. First one filled. Now, I know we're just going to pause here for just a second. But just, just to talk about it because I think it's cool. Type in a nine if your brain just exploded a little bit, just a tad. Because you guys all know, I have no idea what Overstock is doing in 2016 of October. But look at that. Blink. I mean, just based on the level of how, how clean that level is. Wayne says four months to enter a trade. Yeah, that's a GTC EXT good till cancel. Just sitting there, hanging out. Just chilling. Now with earnings coming up, check out what happens. Watch earnings. Bang. You're welcome. At this stage, now you guys know I'm cheating, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I just do this a lot. It's a practice. It's an understanding. It's an awareness of where you're buying things. You want to buy things where it matters. <laughs> so even though I had to wait four months, is it worth it? I mean, how, how quickly is it to flip a house? That's really cool, right? All of that order, and again, it's not a really a surprise to me that it happens coming into earnings, personally. It's really not, because whatever they did or did not know, whatever was going to happen or not going to happen on earnings, they're going to need a lot of buy orders to fulfill. If a lot of people are going to buy some shares, they need someone to sell it to. And who is going to sell it to, except for the people who have sellers down there, if no one else is going to sell their position? Interesting to practice, ladies and gentlemen, interesting to practice because in a situation like this, you would have felt very comfortable, I think, buying a few thousand shares at each price because it's spread out over multiple time frames. It gets a little bit more scary when you're buying a huge chunk all at one time. This is another thing, another way that you want to practice, in my opinion, another way that you want to practice really, really interesting sized orders so that you can start making some money. Obviously, it depends on where you are in your financial game and all those things. I'm aware of that. But as you look at these patterns, you make your money when you buy, just like in real estate. So at this stage, since I'm at a resistance, this is why I love and I, I would fully, I'm, this is not a pitch for collars. This is not a pitch for Vegas. This is me pitching you. You need to learn collars. I teach it for free. I'll teach, I'll pay you to teach it. You can pay me for coaching or watch videos or go to Investopedia because collars allow you to get into markets with size, like size, size, like your IRA 401k size, right? Thousands of share size, like get it, like really buy some stuff because now I can get into an unlosable position. Ladies and gentlemen, I can sell calls and buy puts here for December and sit back until grandma comes home and I just eat blueberry pie all day. Because now, regardless of however much size I put on this, I'm just, I'm chilling. This would be a 1450 strike price. And this would most likely be a net credit. You could get paid to get into this position. This would be December 16th. There we go. So again, we'll just press play just to kind of see what happens. Just so we can analyze it. Maloney says, but isn't that the same thing as putting all of your eggs in one basket? I didn't say all of your size. I just said size. I didn't say every single dollar that you got. Plus, I like baskets. So I like to build them unbreakable. Number one. Number two, do you have any chickens? You got a lot of chickens. Go get more eggs. All right. So here's what's happening on this collar. So on this collar, we would be selling our shares at 17 that we bought at, let's just say 14. $3 a share on however many shares we bought. Plus, we would have gotten into a net credit position to do this trade. I'm just thinking from a time freedom perspective, just so that you can dream at night and get really excited about this. What if you practiced trading to the extent that you could pull up a chart, day trade for fun, and get paid by day trading to be in front of the computer, but most of your money was made from 12 to 20 trades a year that you place and plan and deliberate on for hours at a time. And once you place the position, it just, it does its thing. It's doable. 
And the cool part is, boys and girls, you can start putting yourself in the perspective of doing it now through back trading. And, and you can use pockets of liquidity or moving averages or whatever else you want to use. It doesn't really matter. You can use RSI, you can use MACD, Bollinger Bands, Moon Phase, <laughs> whatever you want. In fact, let's just see what the Moon Phase was doing since it is my boy, Philip Williams' favorite strategy. All right, so you, you had some good buys in here based on the Moon Phase. It caught, it caught some lows for you. But the fun part is, now if we go back over here to the daily chart, right? The, the unique and really exciting part of all this is depending on how you're playing this and depending on what you're doing with it and depending on how you're analyzing it, you can do this on the daily chart. You can do this on the weekly chart. You can do it on the hourly chart. You can do it on all kinds of different time frames. The beautiful part of all of it is, in my opinion, you will never get there in, in real life until you get there in your mind. This is how I developed a lot of the, essentially just the fearlessness of trading, good thing and a bad thing, mostly bad thing initially, because even in my early 20s, I was taught how important back trading was. And at the time, it wasn't as easy as it is now, but I would go back and back trade everything and put myself intentionally in really, really, really bad markets and try to figure out how I could play strategies where I could just lose as small as possible and win somewhere between 20 to 45% constantly. Because if we bought at 14, boys and girls, and we got called away at 17, that's 23% on a relatively large number if we played that with, with some actual size. Tony says, I am in an unlosable collar on NVIDIA and I got a credit for the privilege. Oh, so good, man. Congrats. Well done, brother. This is a great example of a pocket of liquidity. And I did pretty well on NVIDIA. Obviously, I didn't do as well as I could have, but that's always the case. I, I really feel quite happy about how I took this trade. Looking at this level, I'll just draw it out. This area of support is so, so, so clean right here. Really clean, really crisp, really easy to identify. Just a nice, straight, easy line. And the fact that we were right around the 200 simple moving average, this is where I bought some NVIDIA. Right here. Right on top of that area. 125, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, 125. Sold it at 165 over here. It's not bad. So yeah, Tony, I'm really glad that you were able to hold through it and be patient enough and be positive enough and just kind of let it roll out and do your thing for you. Super, super excited for that, brother. Um, because I, I think to me that that's, that's the, really the application, the approach of all this stuff of just knowing where to buy, knowing when to hold, come up with your plan ahead of time and plan it out. That was a really good trade. I mean, again, NVIDIA is, I don't know, top 50 biggest companies in the world. So, I mean, could you have bought, a, could you have bought a thousand dollars worth of NVIDIA there? Sure. But why would you? It's the weekly chart. What's the phrase? What's the saying? The larger the time frame. Larger the time frame, the larger the position. <laughs> Allow yourself to really, yeah, exactly. The longer the time frame, the longer the hold, both of those. Give yourself and allow yourself and just kind of sit down and just know what you're working with so you can really, really start creating this. Because for me, team, I mean, I was just talking to a gentleman the other day. He's got uh, 2 million-ish available to trade with. And was just like, man, do something like, what, what can I do with, you know, 2 million? And in my opinion, I mean, if you trade half of that, let's say you trade a million and you make 30% return a year on that milli, relatively passively, right? Shorting, short collars, long collars, any old specific trade. Then that's 300K. You don't have to live off of all of that, but you could, I, I would hope, live off of 200 pretty, pretty easily if you got your finances in order and everything the correct way. I mean, that's around $20,000 a month, give or take. 
that allows for some pretty nice travel, some pretty cool flexibility. I mean, that's not that bad, but how would he ever do that unless he goes and practices it? I'm not going to call your names, but I want you to tell me, honestly, have you ever sat down, back traded and pretended that you have a $7 million portfolio and just see how you would do with those amount of shares? Type in a two if you've never done that. I want you to just sit down and just go, okay. I mean, it's not going to come into your life if you don't know what to do with it. Money wants to be used creatively. So money is not going to come to you if you go, oh, I'm going to get $7 million. What am I going to do with it? Uh, you know, uh, pay off my credit card debt and pay off my house and pay off my car. And um, there should be no pausing. <laughs> right? You should know. And then again, as you're looking at charts, you should know, what are we doing? Like, are you, if you have a $3 million portfolio, are you going to buy everything up there? Hope not. It is, it's fun. Let's go look at one of the other harder stocks to back trade, Goldman Sachs. We'll do it on a daily chart and I'll do... 2003. All right. So I can't even see what's happening because it's so low. But we'll start in 2003 and we'll just see what's up. All right. Goldman Sachs about to work on a pocket liquidity right here. All right. Let's see what we got here. Going to draw a support level here uh, based off of that 100. Here, based off the 200, and I got exactly where I want to buy there, and I got exactly where I want to buy some there. That's going to be a little bit of a pyramid. I'm going to zoom out just to see if I'm missing anything. Okay, pretty choppy. This is good. This is definitely where I want to really get in, though. Now, I know when I'm doing this, it's like, yeah, of course you want to buy at the support, Newsom. Duh. That's what everyone wants to do. Now, there's been times where I bought a support and there's some recent IPOs and remind me, I can look at that after this happens, that I bought that support and it, and it goes lower. What do you do? Protect yourself. Just because you buy at a pocket liquidity doesn't mean it's going to go up, but it does mean that you should know where you're at, and know where you want to buy. So now we have a really nice pocket there. So basing that on this lower shadow and this support previously. Okay. So now I'm going to zoom into the daily chart. And this is how I would frame this trade. Is I'd buy a little bit here. Buy a little bit here. Buy a little bit right in the middle of those two numbers. And then sit back, relax, and wait and see what happens. Then I come up with a plan that if that doesn't occur, So just for fun, let's create a short collar just so that we can do it at other pockets of liquidities. On the upside, there's gonna be one here. So this is gonna be a limit sell. Limit sell. Limit sell. And limit sell. All right. Plus four and see what happens. First one triggers. Not a big, not a huge surprise. Nice little level right here. Nice support, nice resistance, nice neckline, expecting it to go a little bit higher. All right. There's the doji and there's the breakdown. Also on the daily chart. Oh, wait, that happens on the daily chart? It does. <laughs> so remember, if I'm in short, all right, I'm shorting shares here. I'm already up $2 a share. I could very easily go, all right, if we break above here, buy some protective calls so that now I can protect myself if this bear position goes lower. And on the next two or three bear movements, if we kind of start dropping into here, I can get into 
a short collar by selling calls, buying puts, and potentially turn it into an unlosable trade. But I'm able to identify not only the pocket liquidity, but I'm also able to identify the, the highway of doji. And then we immediately got that selling candle. That's a good thing. This is where it should hold. So if it doesn't, I'm going to get into some protection of some kind just so that I can mitigate my risk. Philip says, will you double your first bullish limit buy to exit short and fill you on the first level? You know it, baby. <laughs> Uh, I love Josh. He's saying, are you saying this works on all time frames? He's being sarcastic because he knows the truth is all everything works on every time frame, just not all the time. But it is really cool to see. So for giggles, I'm going to go to dividends. It's the beginning of the year, 2003. Amazing. Very next day, super strong bull candle. In fact, the very next day was a one white soldier candle. That's why I'm very, very happy I'm in these protective calls. Because I got my pivot. I already knew the level. I already know that pocket liquidity. Boom. Now I got another bear position. So I just shorted. But now I'm also in calls. So I am able to hedge my position. This is what hedge funds are going to do. Hedge funds are using options the way they're designed as insurance. Let's just keep playing it out. Let's have some fun. Beautiful. Now, remember, I am in my protective calls. They are a hedge. They are insurance. Did I get triggered into two short orders, yes or no? So these bearish limit sales, ladies and gentlemen, these are shares, right? Shares don't expire. So if the stock goes lower, I'm profitable. So I got filled on two. I'm losing on the call options. That's fine. Their insurance anyway, but since I'm in the call options, guess what I'm about to do? Now I'm about to sell some puts since I'm in short shares, creating a short collar. And I'm going to do so at a level and a price where I can pay for my protective calls. Going to sell puts so I can also pay for my long calls and still win on this trade. So as an example, um, these would have been, so this was, I'm just checking the date, Jan, so this would have been a February call, Feb expiration. So Feb expiration, put on the top, put on the right, make the font a little bit smaller, okay? And then my put sales, I'd most likely have to sell March. March before earnings. Okay. Dividends are coming. So next day I got my put sales sold and I'm in a really, really, really good spot. I sold high. I sold at a pocket of liquidity. I'm now in a short collar and I'm very well mitigating my risk on this position because even though I'm short, I have long calls to protect. I have sold puts that most likely paid for some, if not all, if not barely most of my long call position. And if the position keeps going lower, I win. If it goes higher, I'm mitigated. And if it goes low enough, then I get out of my position and buy some shares long. Or, yeah, buy some shares long. So we're going to go until March, just so that I can show you all what's happening on this position, okay, coming into earnings. All right. So, again, just to review. Oh, yeah, let's go. To the penny. Oh, man. I love it. So, obviously, this is over the course of a month or and a half or some and some change. But ladies and gentlemen, did the short trade work out? Okay, short trade worked. Was it an absolute banger? Ah, not really. I probably would have made like 15% return-ish, give or take. Because again, I had a long put and I had the sold, I had the long, sorry, long call sold put. So I'm getting out around 67-ish. Right, because I did it, but I'm doing it before earnings. So I'm getting out around here of my short position. 
because in order to get out, since I'm in short shares, right, this I'm profitable at this stage. I'm at my max profit. I exit my position and then just go in and get my long, my long shares at that stage. And I got filled on three out of my four pyramids, all based on one, two things, support and resistance and pockets of liquidity. That's it. Tap into two if you're following me and you flip and love the stuff. Because team, I want you to understand, I'm doing, I would do this with millions of dollars. Because I've sat here, I've done the math enough so that I know the risks and I know the rewards. And you just do not want to get absolutely murdered on the, on the losses. Because on big enough positions over big enough time periods, these 20, 30% gains, man, they really, they really add up. So the limit sell, boom, it worked. Great. Call options are off the board. They're expired worthless. And uh, the puts, I uh, exit my position. And now look at these pocket liquidity, the very, very bottom one. 6103. And you can see on the camera, I don't have anything else here in front of me. So this is just my laptop. So you're seeing what I'm seeing. I got filled on one, two, three levels of my buy zone. And now as we're coming up into earnings, I timed it that way to hope that if we, the reason I, sorry, the reason I stopped it here is because I know earnings is coming up. Corey says, what's the biggest difference between pockets liquidity versus support and resistance? It's really how you play it is the answer. Yep. All right. So since we're just before earnings and I've bought three really large positions, what would I do now? I got a bunch of shares. Yep. I'm getting into a collar. I'm selling calls and I'm buying the puts and I can probably buy at this stage, most likely a $65 put because the stock is at 69. So I can go in and get a $65 put option. Long put, let's say April. Because remember I have some shares at 61, some shares at 62 and some shares at 64. So that would cover my, my total cost basis. And then the call options, I'm going to say 72.50. Also March. And I'm quite confident, sorry, April. I'm, I'm quite confident that this would have given me, and this would give me a net credit on my position. And now I can't lose on the trade. I'm literally coasting for the next month. I'm just, I'm, I'm co Toasty McCoasterson. All right, here we go. Let's press play. Going into earnings. Tweezer, tweezer top, right at the 100, 200, no big deal. Hanging out, doing its thing. Little bull candle, little indecision candle. Now, again, these are both for April. And I'm not saying this is the, it, the, the, is the case. In fact, it most likely isn't. But I'll just like to ask a question because I know a lot of you are coming to Vegas so I can do this even more with you. But on this candle here, is it a possibility, maybe, that I could buy to close this sold call for a small profit, sell to close this long put for a loss, and get into another one? Yeah, I'm just saying it's possible. I'm not going to say I will do it right now. If I could, I would. Meaning if I could buy back my sold call, for a profit and sell my long put. I would do that because what I would be able to do now is have a trigger for a protective put and then go ahead and sell my call option higher so that I can make even more money if it, if it keeps going up. So here's what that would look like just in case it happens. So this will become a trigger, meaning I would only buy it if it goes lower. A trigger for my long put, May, that's the May expiration. So if it doesn't go below there, which it's about to, just FYI, if it doesn't go below there, then I don't have anything to worry about. But if it does, I buy some puts. And then up here, I sell a $75 covered call for May. So this sale 
again, brings in some income and it allows me to sell my shares at a higher price. Next candle, next candle, there we go. So triggered in the puts. I don't care if it goes higher. I'm all about this going as high as it wants to. So we're gonna go all the way to May expiration just to see what happens. Okay. So right here was the day that my collar expired. It would have expired in the money because that was Friday the 16th of May, which is the third Friday. That would have been another winner, right? Locking in realized gain of, I don't know, $14 per share, give or take. And then two days later, if I wanted to, I'm able to start buying shares again, lower than I sold them for, or I could sell puts or whatever, whatever. And if I come in and do some quick analysis, now let me just delete all of this off the screen for just a moment. I bet we could find another really nice pocket of liquidity to buy into. I bet we could. I think the first one's going to be right there, right in this little gap. And then, yeah, obviously, if it pulls back down here, absolutely. I think there's going to be some down here. So, again, really pyramiding into this piece. Thing of this nature. And then for the resistance, start to be a little bit there. And we'll just press play to just see which one happens first, just so we can analyze it and just kind of talk about it. All right. So we rallied, we ran up into here. The purple lines, uh, they were the um, old moving averages. So we had a little bit of a flag pattern looking thing. We broke higher. Obviously we didn't fill these. And then again, just to practice it, we broke above kind of an indecision candle. So we're going to get into protective calls and you guys can all kind of see here. We're in short. We're going to buy protective calls. Let me just make sure that this is still a pretty decent pocket liquidity. Yep, it is. Let's play it out. Earnings is coming right around the corner. Trend is bullish. You're playing counter trend at this stage. You're above the moving averages. Next candle, next candle, next candle. So here's your little tiny small bear candle. So this could be a potential reversal. So now at this stage, we'll get into a more protective calls if it continues above that indecision candle. Right? Again, when you're short positions, what we're going to do is we're going to learn a really, really cool lesson here. Extremely, extremely fun lesson. In more calls. So the question is, what did we learn? Do you guys see how fast we reversed out of that pocket liquidity? Because it was one. When that bear candle comes in, that indecision candle, that's the takeaway that hopefully you guys all have from this position is when you get an area of pocket liquidity, that thing's going to reverse right out of it, or it's just going to keep on going. And you're going to get really more or less one to two candles for that to identify. Because for me, these calls, right, means that if I sell shares here, I'd have the right to buy them at 85. And then I have more calls here that I'm in as this goes higher that I'm able to sell for a profit, hopefully losing nothing on this trade. All because of that one indecision candle that where you find your pocket area, day trade, swing trade, doesn't matter. You're going to get that really quick reversal out of it. And if you don't, you need to protect yourself, flip, or in this situation, I decided to protect myself, right? Protective calls. So the strike price would have been 85 strike. So we're going to pause here for five or six minutes before we hop into the afternoon room just to see if you guys have any questions because I know that was a lot. But this is how I back trade is I really put my mindset in the position of what would I do here based on moving averages, based on the charts, based on, yes, definitely support and resistance, based on the trends. But more importantly, in my opinion, than all of that, knowing what the risk is 
knowing how to mitigate the risk, knowing where to mitigate the risk, knowing how to mitigate the risk, and knowing the numbers behind it. Because then you can place this in your brain, practice it with millions of dollars in your brain on the back trading so that your bank account will be able to receive it in the future when it can start to happen. What do you guys think? <laughs> your brain is melting. <laughs> I like it. Uh, I like it. And you know what the best part is? I think the best part is that this stuff is available since 1973. That's the best part. Corey says, do you factor in volume with the indecision candle? Um, not really. Good question. Let's see what this does on earnings because I'm just curious. So here's a question. Why did I why did I pause the back trade there? Who can tell me? There is a reason. I paused it before the doji. I paused it at that shave top candle. John says, you need to make a decision with earnings coming up. Yep, that's number one. Number two, shave top candle after this type of run-up, ladies and gentlemen. That is not a bullish signal. In my, in my mind, it's almost like I've, tr I've tried to put a really good analogy on shave tops, and I do have a video on them as well. When you get a shave top candle or shave bottom candle bearish after a super, super strong move, it's almost like what's left. All the bulls that can buy or have bought, all they did was buy the whole time, you know? So Justin, the answer to your question is right there. This is where I'm exiting the calls on that shave top candle. What goes up must come down. True. But it just, those shave top candles, man, after that big, that big of a move, it's just like, who's left? The whole day, buy, 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 buy. You're, you're like a little club and that's the only track. Like the DJ fell asleep and it's just, <laughs> there's no selling pressure left, which is, if there's no sellers, Right. And just a bunch of people who are buying. Yes, the price goes up for sure. But then at some point, the sellers come out in strong, strong force because there's no more buyers left. Everyone's been buying. And then, yeah, that pullback back into that exact same area. And, and then the bounce from that, I think, is really not extremely surprising to me. Because I viewed this price as a pocket of liquidity bearish. So if I'm going to view that as a pocket of liquidity bearish, I should probably try to buy there as well. Fun stuff, team. Long story short, the whole presentation backtrade a lot more. And that was that was the that's the name of the game. Have fun with your backtrading, right? Backtrade with a purpose. Don't just backtrade to backtrade. Like go in and really know why you're doing it. This was the last trade that I took on Goldman Sachs, by the way slayed this one. You guys want to know why? All from a pocket of liquidity. <laughs> I saw what happened. I wasn't the guy, but notice meow, all of those stops that are right below those little lower shadows. Bang, 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 bang. All these little guys right there. And again, I wasn't in there. I didn't buy at that price, but I saw that it happened. And this was the analysis that I came up with. I'm sure most of you remember from the afternoon room, uh, did it on the 26th of January. But this is what it looked like at the time. I said, okay, here's what I need. 
We got some trapped people down here, these lower shadows. You got three bull candles in a row. This is a wicked pair candle. It's actually triple wicked pair candle, all bouncing off the 100. Really, really good support. And, and, and check out all of this bear volume. Bang sauce. So if we close above that volume, this is my analysis. If we close above that volume, buy the retest of that volume high. Now, some of you might've been in the, that afternoon room, type in a two, if you remember it. No? Okay. Well, now that means I have to go get the video. There's no one you guys remember it. That's not good. I want you guys to take these trades with me. So candle closes above the resistance. So the close with that resistance, you can see Mr. Squiggles, right? I wanted it to pull back into that high bang. There's the pullback into it. So that's the entry and that's the target. Beautiful trade. If you're still in this trade, great time to get into probably a collar of some kind uh, if you have enough shares to do so. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is Pockets Liquidity, how I trade them, how I use them, how I use them to trade, and the time frame in which I will analyze them to make some gains in the market so that I can go buy assets, be smart with my money, and make incredible friends, amazing networks, do awesome things with fantastic people like yourself. Love you guys so much. Bye.